is because uh, Woolpole comes up every three years and, and, and at the moment we're asking you to vote at Woolpole. Uh, and when we, you, you will have received a lot of literature in the last uh, couple of months and there's certainly there's some more there for you today. Uh, but we want you to get out and vote and, and we wanted to tell you what we've been doing uh, and what we want to do in the next three year strategic period. What you are voting on for this wool poll is the next strategic period of the company, the next three year strategic period of the company. So it's very important, well that's better with that uh, air conditioning on. Uh, so it's very important that uh, you uh, get out and vote and certainly encourage your neighbours and anyone you see to get out and, and vote. And I know, I know that there's some um, um, brokers here today and, 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 and that have certainly, we know have been very, very active in in supporting uh, us to get out uh, to get that message out, I wanted to step back now and talk about 2009. In 2009, you had the last wool poll, and for the first time ever, uh, the board of AWI decided to talk about in the wool poll voter information kit in 2009 how they were going to split the funding and spend the funding. Before that, it was simply at the board's discretion. The board just made up their mind on the day how they wanted to spend it or in that year how they wanted to spend it. Wool growers never had clarity on that. But in 09 we put it into the voter information kit. This board, this current board, put that into the voter information kit. And that, what they said back in 09 is they would spend half your money on R&D and half your money in marketing. And that was put in there. And of course 2% was the vote that was recommended and 2% was returned in 2009. And then we've been working on that strategic period for the last three years. This is the last year of that strategic period. And we've been working on a 50-50 ratio split. And I come back to this at the end of the, in, end of the presentation, but I wanted to firstly show you uh, how we split the revenue and some operations, uh, some operating um, uh, things of the company. Uh, so I'll go through those first and then we'll go on and we'll talk about Woolpole a bit later on and on-farm and off-farm research. And this is what the this is the audited accounts for last year, the 11-12 year. So we're plus or minus three percent. Now, when when that was returned at Woolpole, that was then written into the statutory funding agreement with the government. So the government wrote the 50-50 into that, and they said we also want to measure you on that. We want to measure you on how much you're spending, and we've got to supply these figures to the Department of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fishery every year. And they give us a plus or minus five percent tolerance. The first year of the strategic period. Last uh, year before last, we were plus or minus 2%. This year we're plus or minus 3%. This last year just audited. So that's, where, that's, that's how your money's been expended and we are measured on that. And we are also putting into this particular wool poll the ratio split, but we're asking to move the ratio slightly. We, you may have read about it, may have noticed it. We're asking to move it slightly in favour of marketing. I'm going to show you, show you those figures later on in the presentation so you can see exactly what we're going to do with those funds and how we're going to break them up. So that's uh, the ratio split. Uh, there's a bit of, uh, uh, there's some pub things published and peddled out there about our operating costs uh, being at record highs. No, they're not. They're just, that's just not true. They're at half what they used to be. Pretty much half, 50% of what, what the, the company's operating costs were. And they'll remain at half what, the, what they used to be. We're tracking at about 24 million, and you'll see there the 12, 13 year, I've got an F next to it for forecast. We'll continue to track at 24 million. What I can tell you is, between there and there, we doubled our project spend. Doubled it. We took it from 23 million to 46 million and maintained our operating costs, reduced our operating costs. That's tough to do. That's really tough to do. And we, of course, we, we, we monitor this all the time. We monitor what our operating costs are all the time uh, and make sure that we're working within our means. We're very conscious of wool prices uh, and are keeping a close eye on that. So we've maintained, we've re dramatically reduced this board. This administration of the company has dramatically reduced the operating costs of the business. It's not maybe they have, they have, halve them, halve them and we'll continue to keep them at that level even though we're increasing our project spend. Our heart rate's gone up, our costs are coming down and I'll talk about uh, this in, in this next slide. 
These are the reserves. I want to show you all the figures here. I'm not, we're not hiding anything this, this, the, 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 this particular uh, road show. We're showing you every figure that we've got. And this is, the, uh, this is the reserves of the company dating back to the start of AWI. And people say, oh, well, the, the, the reserves are at record highs. That's not a fact either. In 2003, we had reserves of 116 million. They are currently at 103.4 million. Significant? No doubt, significant. And the board's resolved to draw down on those reserves in the next strategic period. And we'll I'll show you exactly how we're going to draw down. But these are the reserves of the company. Now, there's a couple of things I want to show you here. This line here is the next strategic period and how we're going to draw down on the reserves. But they want to leave something at the end too. They want to leave something in the bank at the end of that three year strategic period, the end of 15, 16. Then there's a couple of other things here. The first is required reserves and the second is intangible equity. So we work above those lines. The, the required reserves is a formula that's made up of, of a few different things, but the first thing is we keep five million dollars in reserves for exo exotic animal disease response. That's got to be kept. The government asks us to keep that. So we keep that in reserve. The other thing is, if you ha with any wool poll, you must offer zero as an option. We have to offer zero. We like that. We like that zero is always an option there, and it's written into our Wool Privatisation Act. So we can't do even if we didn't like it, we couldn't do anything about it. If, if zero is an option there, there's always the chance that zero could be returned. It's a remote chance, but there's a chance. So you've got to keep some funds there. You've got to be aware of what it might cost to wind up a business like ours. And what, what would it, we'd have to do to wind it up? And there's projects at the company that are out four, five, six years and they would have to be expedited. They are contracts out four or five, six years. So we allow for those and we allow for some operating costs to wind up the business. So we keep a formula there and that figure comes to about 37, point, about $37 million. And they are required reserves. We supply that, we audit that every year and we supply that to the government as well. And then above that, there's a piece of intangible equity. And that intangible equity is the value of the wool mark. Now you might say, geez, that seems cheap. You know, that's not, it is cheap. It's really cheap, but that's what it came to us as. When we merged with the Woolmark company, the value they put on the Woolmark to bring it across to our books was $10 million. So with any intangible equity, you can't look at valuing it up. You can only look at impairing it. And every year we've got to look at impairing it. Now, if we were to sell that, and we never would, but if you were to sell it and you got 70 million, someone offered you 70 million, he could put it on his books at 70 million because he's just paid 70 million for it but we got it on our books at 10 million and we can't value up, we can only impair it. So that's, that's the, that's the uh, required reserves and the intangible equity. I'll go through these figures in great detail a bit later on, but I wanted to show you that in the, on the slide and how we're gonna draw down. And we don't want these peaks, dramatic peaks and troughs where the business is going into the ground. You can see here, this, this little, this, uh, that's, that's getting a little desperate. That's getting a little close to the line and that's, that's exactly where the current board of AWI took over. We're not making this up. This is, these are the real figures. And then it went up, and it went up for a couple of reasons. It went up because wool prices went up. We started marketing wool, and wool prices went up. And when wool prices go up, we get more levy. That's a fact. But the other thing is, we halved our operating costs too. We started saving money and putting money back in the bank. So we'll pro that, that, the, the, the reserves went up for two reasons, not one. Went up because we got more levy, granted. But they also went up because we cut costs dramatically. And we'll continue to look at ways of doing this, making our business more efficient and cutting costs. So they're the reserves. The human resources of the business are like this, look like this. We have 15 offices around the world in 13 different countries. We have other agents elsewhere in the world so in actual fact, we cover 26 countries uh, around the world. And we're adjusting the size of those businesses depending on the priority. Of course, China is a, is a big focus of ours and will continue to be a big focus of ours. But every one that we had in China was, was based around uh, supporting manufacturing, you know, technical staff. And all of a sudden, China's become a consumption market. We had no marketing staff there. So we're swinging the ratio there, away from our 
manufacturing because as China swings from a manufacturing to a consumption market, the human resources we have in a market like that have got to be appropriate for that market. So we're, we're constantly looking at those, those particular offices and seeing whether we have the appropriate resources for that business. <coughs> we have a ratio of 60% uh, of the company are women, 40% are men. Now that's unusual for an agricultural business. Uh, it's unusual for the wool industry. We like it. We think it's good. And that's not by, done by design, it's done by destiny. We simply employ the best people we can get. The average age is 38. That's come down two years in the last year. The average age last year at the AGM that I put up was 40. It's come down. We haven't got rid of any senior citizens, but we have got some, some, some really young staff that have come on. And the balance of resources, the age of the resources, human resources that we've got in the business are just perfect to take us into the next three year pe period. We've had, some, we've had a lot of adjustments to do in the last three years. We knew that we couldn't do it all in one year. It, 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 it burdens the business too much. But we have made dramatic human resource changes every year. Big ones, big expensive ones. That's another way that we've been able to cut costs. And we've got the balance right. We won't, the, the, the instruction to all the staff is stop. No more, no changing, just stop where you are. So. You know, I'd like to think this will go up. This this human resource slide will go up the AGM, at the, uh, coming up in November. Next year's AGM, it should look exactly the same. Except to say, you'd want to improve. Um, well, you don't have to. This is still a, these two figures are still good figures. They stay with us about five and a half years. That's good. At five years, you're starting to incur long service leave. So we're always working to make sure that we keep those, keep the uh, the people that we've got. So we always want to push that figure out. And the other, the other thing is turnover is 6.3. Now, in a, in, a, in, a, in a place like here in Dubbo, uh, that, that, that might be very normal. It might be even lower than that. But in a city like Sydney, it's about 15%. So we're tracking OK there. We're, we're always looking to improve that to the turnover in the last 12 months. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Rob Langtree. I'm going to have a bit of a spell and then Peter um, uh, Peter Ackroyd is going to talk after, um, uh, after Rob. And Rob's going to go through the marketing strategies of the business. We've got some videos to uh, show you here, so uh, uh, be patient. I don't think, we think it's an interesting way of showing you and demonstrating what we're doing. So, uh, uh, welcome Rob. On the 1st of July 2010, the Australian wool industry, therefore the wool industry, went back into the business of marketing wool. For about 12 to 15 years before that, very little or no marketing was done of the fibre. There were brands out there using our product, those brands didn't talk about it. And when I came in and started working with Stu and with the, with the board, um, I was quite interested to find there were Italian merino sheep. In fact, there aren't, but it's a good story for them to tell. Um, so a large part of what we're doing is overcoming a little bit of lethargy and a lot of lack of knowledge. Uh, the way we talk about it internally is to say that in that 12 to 15 years, What's happened is that the wool industry has lost a generation. It's lost a generation of consumers and it's lost a generation potentially of designers, the people who actually design apparel. Most of your wool, um, some of the broader microns not so much, but most of your wool goes into apparel in varying shapes and forms. And a lot of what we have to do is really educate a new generation of consumers and in some cases, at the, I think I'm on the older end of Stuart's demographic there, but even remind people who've forgotten what wool's about, why wool is, is appropriate for apparel, and even talk about the fact that wool's changed. I think in the time I've been around, the clips find up about a micron, it's gone back another half micron. But the wool that we're all used to consuming now, if you go into DJs or Meyer, is a very different thing from when I was growing up and I had a 25 micron sweater I wore every day with a blue stripe on it. Um, it's a very different product experience. So a large part of what we do, while it has different campaign themes, is about educating various sectors within the uh, consumer market, apparel, and as Peter comes in, he'll talk a bit more about apparel and interiors, about a fibre and about a product they know nothing about, or very little about. So that's our charge. One of the first things we did in that first couple of months in 2010 was come up with a campaign where it's a theme line called No Finer Feeling. And we use this campaign to tie together a number of different activities that we do. Some of those, although increasingly uh, less and less, is what you might call traditional advertising. Increasingly more and more in an accelerating rate of this is about social media, about digital media, 
about videography and about education through uh, literally bringing the fibre to life. So I'll talk about each of these four campaigns. Woolmark Prize, I'll talk about in a sec. Gold Woolmark is a China-based campaign. It addresses the issue that Stuart started off by saying, and I think our chairman is quoted as saying, our market is China, China and China. And then the last one I'll have Peter talk to because uh, he was, I guess, the man behind its success. One of the key dimensions, and, and I keep looking at George in the corner of my eye because he's the one that keeps me accountable. He's the one that every board meeting says, but you said we're going to measure this. And we do. One of our measures is the level of engagement with retail trade and with brands. As the wool industry, even with the numbers Stuart showed you, if you look at gross apparel globally, and you're talking about a couple of hundred million dollars worth of sales, the Australian wool industry is a very small part, a very small voice in that global market. So for us to be heard, we can't do it by ourselves. We need to work with companies that take the fibre, turn it into fabric, take the fabric and turn it into fashion apparel and or interiors. Over the last couple of years, when you remember we had 10 or 12 years, 15 years we were out of the game, we had to rebuild relationships with our partners in the industry offshore. And that took a little time. So year one, we had the Benetton company and we had Missoni join us in talking about the benefits of wool. Um, and we looked a bit like a fashion brand um, because we wanted to be back in that space. Even by using consumer media, we were trying to say to the global fashion industry, oi, forget, don't forget wool. We're back in the business and we want to be part of this conversation. Year two, we got a little bit more support from the industry. So we added Armani, which was iconic for us in the top end of fashion. Xenia, which many of you know as a company and as a buyer, um, and Laura Piana, who obviously looks at that top end. This list of 30 participants is in market right now. So we've gone to two, to five, to 30. The point of all of that is that there are 30 voices out there talking in various ways about why consumers should consider what the apparel's made of and summarising that by saying, if you wear wool, if you deal with wool, there's no finer feeling than actually wearing that natural fibre. So that's what that campaign's about. One of the voices that we're using this year, um, I, I can't help but smiling about it because um, it's a very unusual person. The person that I'm going to show you a video of, of her um, is a very strong environmentalist in her home market and globally. She is not a young person, but she's a person who has very high credibility in two areas. For an older, mature designer, her brand is probably the hottest thing in Hong Kong right now, and also in Europe. And she's known to be very ethical. So when she talks about wool being a natural fibre that has qualities that are appropriate to apparel, people believe her. So you'll see this in various forms. It's in digital form, it's on video, it's on the internet, it's on YouTube. But just have a look at how we work with these people and take their brand to talk about our product. I just love wool and want to promote it, that's all. What I would say about wool is we, we looked into it and we feel reassured that, that wool is the most ecologically friendly um, fibre. And I'm glad to know that now wool is becoming so popular because it is so comfortable. It's just the most fantastic thing to wear. I love it on the body. It's, a, it's, it's something you can sleep in, you know. It's soft. But at the same time, it's strong it's because it's very, very springy. When I was not terribly well established as I am now as a designer, I reintroduced into the fashion world fine knitwear. When I started with Vivian about these weavers and the mills in Huddersfield, when they said, you know, they showed me the archive and I saw this fabric and they were so incredibly beautiful and complicated. I like a very, very fine, lightweight wool. We've, we've made some bodysuits out with hundreds of buttons. Actually, it's a thing you can play with. It's endless, the combinations. The way that it feels on your body and the way it looks, it looks cosy and it looks like body enhancing. It makes you think of the body. 
and of course you can get loads of different textures. When you cut it and you stitch it together, it just looks always amazing. And that's this cloth. You can't fail. It always looks what my husband would call souverain. My motto for fashion is buy less, choose well, make it last. And wool is, is something that should last you even your lifetime. So she's a wee bit quirky. Um, I think we were doing a press launch, Peter, if you remember, in uh, London at one stage, and uh, she was a bit late for the press conference, which usually you don't do. She was late because she bicycled from Battersea to King's Cross. So you get it. Um, that level of commitment, again, is a very strong message, not only who she is, but what she says. If you're in Nathan Road next time on the corner, where all those shops are in Hong Kong, if you walk out of your hotel, the first shop you'll see is hers. And the Chinese in there are buying handbags and apparel that uh, have retail prices we could only ever dream about being able to afford. The point of this is that you've got a very highly positioned brand with a very ethical spokesperson being used across a multiple number of media to carry a message and there's about 30 of them out there doing it with us now. So that's the dynamic behind the No Finer Feeling campaign. The other thing is when I started off I was talking a little bit about this missing or this lost generation of, of uh, designers. One of our concerns is that because of that hiatus over that period, as new designers from new markets, not the traditional markets like Italy or France or Germany or, or the UK, come in, are we connecting them with the fibre? And we've been finding progressively over the last few years that people who have even done technical courses and degree qualified courses in fashion design know nothing about fibre. They know a little bit about fabric and they know a lot about silhouette and cut and a little bit of drape, but no reasons behind it. So we brought back this year a program uh, which started in the 50s um, and is really designed at two things. It's designed to target young emerging designers in emerging markets or that have an interest in emerging markets and bring them into commercial success through wool. Get them young, teach them tricks. Uh, this program started in May. Uh, the initial round of this, which was a, a regional competition, um, hit us around then and the response from media globally has been very strong. When I get to the back end of what I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about the importance of social media and content. But what this program does is generate a very large amount of content coming from a number of different areas that are not typically just the fashion capitals of the world and identifies young designers who want to work with the fibre. I'll have someone else tell you about it probably more succinctly than I can. In 1936, Australian wool growers voted for a sixpence levy to be imposed on each bale they produced to promote their product around the world. This audacious visionary decision resulted in the formation of a body first known as the International Wool Secretariat. One of the initiatives of the IWS was a fashion design award to highlight the versatility and modernity of wool. At the 1954 awards, two young, unknown women's wear designers, Karl Lagerfeld and Yves Saint Laurent, stepped on stage to accept their respective fashion design prizes. It was at that moment, with thanks to the wool industry, that fashion history was made. With over 60 years of design award experience, the International Woolmark Prize has now been reinvented for a new generation, shifting focus from glamour to true talent, whilst highlighting Wool's eco-credentials in line with today's modern consumer expectations. The prize represents Woolmark's social commitment, a sharing of resources and supporting local artisans. It's a way to express talent, aligning the support of emerging designers with the evolution of emerging countries. The competition will draw on the best talent from around the globe, focusing on the key consumption markets of Northern Europe, Southern Europe, US, China, India and Australia, with the final award to be held at London Fashion Week in 2013. Partnering across these regions, International Fashion Bible Vogue will provide support and credibility, ensuring it quickly becomes one of the most prestigious design awards globally. 
Woolmark's global network has secured commitment from the world's most exclusive boutiques and retailers, including Harvey Nichols in London and Hong Kong. Young designers are very important to Harvey Nichols. So this award facilitating and recognising young designers, we're really in support of because we're always looking out for the new designer, the latest designer, because we've got a very fashion forward customer. With long-standing tradition, Australian wool innovation continues to support the future of design, assisting emerging talent to occupy a solid place in the global apparel industry through the honour and prestige of such an international prize. The benefits of this particular approach is that it doesn't use advertising. It uses a combination of event activity um, and public relations. The other thing is that the judges that sit on these regional panels and then on the global panels are in themselves icons within the fashion industry. You might be asking yourself, well, how come you're focusing so much at the top end? That's not necessarily where the volume is. But the way the apparel business works is all the influence is top down. So if we're in brands like Harvey Nichols or um, um, where are we in, uh, Neiman Marcus or, or uh, uh, David Jones or, or areas like that, even though people come in and look at that fashion, they'll also buy within that environment another, a number of other articles. They won't necessarily come into a, a mid to bottom tier retailer and then go up within that sort of space. So this really enables us to do two things, is to take that partnership idea, include designers in it, include retailers in it, identify new talent and promote them through. You may have read there's a young fellow called Dion Lee, and Dion Lee's the Australian regional finalist that's going to be going in... Uh, into uh, Europe in February, into the UK, and be judged and, uh, and hopefully awarded. We can't say that, we've got independent judges, but um, that's the whole point of that particular program. Another key area, and, and perhaps the most compelling area, and Stuart will come back and talk to it uh, towards the end of the presentation as well, is the unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity we have in China. We have an upside and a downside. The downside is that in China, over the last 12 to 15 years, the type of product that Chinese consumers see is not particularly the best display of our fibre. You could walk onto a Lane Crawford uh, specials table in Hong Kong, pick up a sweater, it'd have a wool mark on the back of it, you buy it for seven Hong Kong dollars and it'd pill in 20 seconds. So one of the issues for us is that we need to change up the positioning of wool. We need to redefine in the Chinese consumers' terms what wool is. We did some qualitative research about eight weeks ago in, in uh, China and frighteningly, I guess it's common in, in a number of other markets, when we asked people where cashmere and wool came from, they said, oh, the cashmere is the good part of the wool and the other stuff must be processed. They didn't understand there were two beasts. They didn't even understand that there were two marginally different fibres. So we've got a massive job to do. But again, in this particular market, if you're not in this market now as it emerges from being a production-based uh, market to a consumption-based market, then we're going to miss an opportunity of a lifetime. So China, in the board's terms, is a key critical priority for us, and it's one where we've developed this program called Gold Woolmark. We started with this program three years ago. Um, we had a bit of a feel for how the market worked. We've refined it, and it's now back in the market again on a national basis, targeted uh, at the top end of the market, but using a very different marketing techniques. It's essentially what we call data-driven marketing. So it's finding people who've got the money to spend on clothing at this level, who have actually got a track record of spending it, and then appealing to them directly, using sampling, using database marketing, using interactive technology. I'll show you what looks like a very traditional piece of film, but it's the, it's the keystone, if you like, of how we communicate this particular mark, gold wool mark. Importantly, what we found also in the same research was that in the past it wasn't so, and now it is, that if you connect Australia and Australian wool, with European quality heritage fibre, uh, fabric, with a brand or a set of brands that the consumer uh, understands, their willingness to pay at a higher rate back through that supply chain is exponentially increased. So this is the first time in the first market where we've overtly gone out there and said, see this particular Ferragamo product? That's made from British cloth that's woven in Yorkshire. That British cloth woven in Yorkshire is from Australian merino wool. Do you want it or not? And the needle goes bing. So I'll just show you this piece. Um, Stuart reminded me to say that you won't, under, you won't know who the presenter is, but he's the equivalent of Parco. He's the equivalent of a Michael Parkinson in China. But it'll just give you a feel for how we're positioning the product.
曾几何时，想要得到那样一套笔挺的西装和那样一条端庄的连衣裙，你就必须不远万里跨越半个地球。我们今天在这些杂志上所看到的时装潮流，实际上都已经触手可及了。就像在这样的高档店铺，或者这样的定制西装店里。那么这些心灵手巧的设计师和裁缝们，又从哪里得到这些高大的面料来制作这些精美的服装呢？他们来到位于北英格兰三菱环抱的约克郡，造访了已经为数不多的专业加工厂。这些工厂在生产高级金纺面料方面已经拥有了几百年的丰富经验和历史。他们还探访了欧洲其他一些地方的毛纺织公司，那里生产的面料也让世人趋之若鹜。实际上呢，所有这些高档面料呢，都来自一种令人惊叹的可再生的天然纤维，我们就叫它羊毛。那就像只是把它简单的叫做一辆汽车，或者呢，就像把它叫做一幢房子。因为造就了世界上华美植物的那种无比精细的羊毛，来自于世界上独一无二的优质绵羊品种——美利诺绵羊。而绝大多数的美利诺绵羊呢，生活在一个独特的国家，那就是澳大利亚。要制作这种优雅而高档的面料和衣服，工艺技术极其复杂。不过，有幸的是，要识别这样的面料和衣服，并不复杂，只要找到这样的一个标志。就可以了。So you can see from that, even though there's a lot more depth underneath it. How we're positioning the fibre, and how we're essentially saying to Chinese consumers who can afford to be in this space, these are the reasons why you should actually invest in、uh, something made from Australian merino wool. The other thing is that if you look at the sequence of these campaigns that we do, each one of them is targeted at reducing a number of barriers to consumption that over the years our research has told us to overcome. One of those barriers is this constant one that you've all heard before: wool's hot, itchy, scratchy. Some people even say you can be allergic to wool. That is not the case. You know that. Unfortunately, not all consumers do. So what we decided to do was to confront it head on like that and say, if you can put a newborn baby on a piece of wool top and that baby's comfortable in that space, then surely it can't be allergenic, and surely it's something that is actually not as itchy and hot and scratchy as you thought. I'll show you another video here. Interestingly, this girl was born about two streets away from my mum in Townsville. People don't really know that she's actually、uh, an Aussie,、um, but she's iconic in this space, and she's respected. She's also one of the UN ambassadors for a number of children's programs globally, and she's engaged with us now through 2014, talking about how wool relates to this mother area of mother and baby. This is not necessarily about selling a lot of blankets and small baby items. It's about what it says about the fibre, as much as it is about the product that you see it on. I've just completed a three-day shoot for Woolmark with 12 little newborn babies, and I have to say it's been one of the most enjoyable campaigns that I've ever shot. When Woolmark first approached me to do this, I thought it was just a complete fit with all of the work that I've been doing for the past 30 years. And when we first started going back through my archives, I was really surprised at how naturally I'd been drawn to wool from the very start. So, surprisingly, we got all of these babies fast asleep in these wool props. So that says something for the the gorgeous qualities of this. Merino wool, especially the amazing top that we've been using. So good on you, Woolmark, and the merino wool is fantastic. And you see this iconic image. We've actually just finished producing another one, which is pink in colouring. 
or we've reshot it again with a little another different baby. That one's probably two years old now. Um, but it, we find it very powerful, not only at a consumer level, but at a trade level, to confront this issue of people who think they know wool when in fact they don't. Uh, I should also say that uh, one of our guys, Paul Swan, has done a lot of work in, in actually doing the science behind this argument. So we've got research which proves that it's not a dermatological irritant. It's not actually an allergen. So a lot of that also comes in to support these more image, more softer, more uh, type attitudes that we, we're trying to create. Social media. Um, I'm looking at the average age in the room and I'm probably around about the same age, I think. Um, I grew up in the marketing industry, not in the wool industry. When I grew up, communication was about buying television space or buying magazine space. It was expensive. It would cost you half a million dollars to shoot a piece of film and five and a half million dollars to get people to see it. Um, that whole game in the last three years has completely changed. I've had to relearn my craft, my skills, to do what we do now. And that's because of the advent of social and digital media. Social media is not just your grandkids wor kids working on iPads searching Google. Around about 60% of the purchases that Chinese consumers make are made either online or offshore. That's a big number, online or offshore. They do it online or offshore because if they buy it at retail, they're worried it's not real. So some people might go there to buy fakes. The Chinese in our market actually want the real product and there's a risk if they don't do that. The other thing is there's a luxury goods tax in China, in Shanghai in particular, that affects the market that's 30%. So if you look at it and you say, social media, is that just about communicating? No, it's about completely reinventing the way that retail and e-commerce and commerce works. We like to think that, e that because we have a reasonably light background and we've been out of the market, one of the advantages AWI has is we can, re we can be reasonably quick to adapt and adopt these new strategies, these new media opportunities. The other thing is that it allows us to focus your investment dollars on telling the story without having to pay for the media the way we may have done in the past. And classically, the wool industry used to been, spend hundreds of millions of dollars on media. I doubt this you will get to 10 but we will produce a lot of content. We will tell a lot of stories and the market is coming because of the, this social media stuff's really hungry. You know, if you imagine that there's, I can't even remember, George probably can, but there's probably a billion sites out there all looking for new content all the time. One of the things that the Australian wool industry has that's unique in many cases for the rest of the world is the stories that you as growers have to tell about the fibre or that we have to tell with our partners about how it's processed and its benefits. So social media is actually playing to our game. It's actually helping us expand our footprint. I'll show you a very brief um, summary of where we're at with this at the moment.
that 999999999 figure is where we think we'll get this year on, on reach. We'll get close to a billion people looking at those sorts of images. Again, they probably need to see them more than once, but we're across the media in terms of presenting this content. A number of people have asked us through these sessions, OK, that's great. You're doing a pretty good job, we think, maybe, in fashion and apparel. What are you doing for the broader microns? You know, this tends to focus on the finer end of the clip. What do we do in the broader microns? This whole concept of educating consumers moves from fashion right the way across into interiors and into carpets. What I'd like to do is to introduce you to Peter Ackroyd. Peter um, lives in London. Um, I wouldn't say he's Prince Charles's best mate, but they know each other. Um, Peter's really been fantastic for us in terms of engineering a campaign, which is not, again, a traditional advertising campaign, but it's about events and it's about engaging consumers and engaging media. I have Peter just talk you through what he's been up to. I'm Peter Ackroyd. I'm from London, but I was born in Yorkshire. Uh, in Bradford, where uh, many years ago, when my grandmother was alive, when she was a girl, 77,000 people worked processing Australian merino in Bradford Mills. That's no longer the case. What's left is a niche industry which is supplying luxury brands and supplying uh, interior textiles to the high standards and supplying floor, floor coverings to the high standards. Um, let me take you back to February 2009, 26th of February, Clarence House, Prince Charles's residence in St. James's in London. Uh, Prince Charles called in about 10 to 12 experts of the, from the textile trade to complain about his poor wool check. 2009 was a bad year. The beginning of 2009 was just after the massive crash had happened and the banks were failing and everything was falling down around us and Prince Charles said well my farmers don't want to farm wool there's no point what's the point in even collecting the wool we get nothing for it we don't even need to shear them it's it, it's absurd so he said I want to start a campaign for wool let me fast forward you to 2010 uh, January Australia Day on a cold cold clear day in Cambridgeshire, the Campaign for Wool was launched. The slide there is the Campaign for Wool as it was in Australia. It moved to Australia uh, in, in a big way in uh, Sydney in 2011. And these were the um, partners that partnered with the Prince of Wales' Campaign for Wool here, here in Australia. So here he is, the, uh, the Prince of Wales talking about wool. Why is he talking about wool? Well, he's a farmer. He believes in sustainability. He believes in renewables. He's an environmentalist. Um, but he also believes in luxury brands. And I'm reminded of uh, my good friend, the late Rod Thurkle Johnson, who from his, many years ago, uh, we collaborated on several projects. And Rod, when the Prince of Wales announced his campaign, was one of the first farmers to write to him. And he said to me, I'm always very proud that my wool goes to the finest brands in the world. But to have a royal environmental sign-off is beyond my dreams, it's superb. And this, is, and this is what we've got. We've got the world's leading environmentalist who I thought was slightly cranky 20, 30 years ago, now being the man of the, 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 man of the moment, the man of the moment of Met, where high fashion is wanting to tell consumers about where their fiber comes from. It's called provenance and it's called quality assurance and it's called environmental responsibility. The Prince of Wales uh, was keen that we should all work together so the Campaign for Wool is a Commonwealth uh, operation. Here's, here's a message from Prince Charles. Ladies and gentlemen, I can only apologise for making this uh, somewhat disembodied yet, I hope, suitably low carbon appearance. But I, I did just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone at AWI for their support for my campaign for wool. Since I launched this initiative at the start of 2010, it has really gained momentum around the world, and this is in no small part thanks to the support from everyone in the Australian wool industry. Now, I have fond memories of spending time on various sheep stations when I was lucky enough to live in Australia for six months, over 40 years ago now and uh, being able to see for myself just how important wool is to so much of this 
vast country. I could not have been more depressed, therefore, when I saw the price farmers were being paid for their wool had dropped to such low levels that many were leaving farming and the numbers of sheep were falling dramatically. The ultimate insanity was when I learnt that a new breed of sheep had been developed which doesn't need shearing, called, can you believe it, easy care. Determined to, to do something about this and to restore wool to its rightful place in the scheme of things, I convened a meeting with representatives of wool growing organisations from around the world, along with fashion designers, interior designers, carpet manufacturers, and importantly, retailers. It was clear that everyone realised that wool was a remarkably versatile, renewable, natural product, but that consumers had completely forgotten its benefits. The result of the meeting is this campaign, which I'm delighted to say is backed by all the major trade organisations. So, in addition to AWI, it is supported by the British Wool Marketing Board, uh, the International Wool Textile Organisation, Woolmark International, the New Zealand Wool Growers, and Viking Wools of Norway. There are also many other companies and organisations making up the largest coalition in recent history, who are helping to raise awareness amongst consumers about wool's unique properties, which are, when you uh, actually look at them, pretty amazing. Whether it is the clothes you choose to wear or the products which uh, furnish your home, it is clear nature has the edge on the man-made competition. For example, and most importantly, wool is naturally flame retardant to some 600 degrees and can even uh, meet the most stringent safety rules without the need for additional chemical treatments. Something to consider when you are buying, say, clothes for your children or furnishing your house. Apart from being uh, the most environmentally friendly insulating material, wool has the most excellent natural handling properties. Its renowned drape is due to the fineness of the fibres as well as its natural elasticity and resilience. Wool has a structure which allows it to absorb and release perspiration naturally, whether that is in clothes or in the home. It is able to acclimatise to individual environments, which means that a wool jumper will ensure you are never too hot or too cold. And perhaps most surprisingly, the evidence shows that if you use wool duvets or blankets, then you are more likely to get a good night's sleep. There are, of course, many more reasons to use wool, and a large number of these are listed on the campaign's website at uh, www.campaignforwool.org. But we mustn't forget that one of the main benefits of wool is its impact on our environment. More and more people now want to know how they can leave a lighter footprint on the planet. By choosing wool, you can do just that and benefit from the most superior product from some of the most hard-working farmers in the world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the Prince of Wales is, a, can I say, a man of many microns. Um, he believes that wool should be a lifestyle choice and uh, he's supporting not only the apparel industry, he's supporting the carpet industry, the uh, soft finishing industry and much to my uh, pleasure the hand knitting industry. The Ackroyds have been in hand knitting for three generations in the, in the north of England and the brand is still there and it's my ambition to bring wool back into hand knitting wool but that's another story. Uh, but, that, but, 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 but that I'm sure will happen. Um, we are, I think our major breakthrough was uh, having uh, persuading the Westminster Council to allow us to graze sheep uh, these lovely Beaumont sheep, Beaumont sheep on Savile Row uh, in front of all the fine tailoring houses of London, many of which have an immense global footprint uh, in China, Japan and North America. Um, it was a fine day, wasn't it, Stu, 11th of October 2010. Uh, the sun shone on Savile Row and that launched the campaign. Well, you can't see it at the end, but there is um, an Australian sign that says uh, sheep ahead. 
um, on both ends of Savile Row, and that was widely reported in the press throughout the world. Um, the great heroes of the campaign for wool are British fashion icons, again with a global footprint. Um, a lot of these people sell far more in terms of their brand the, outside the UK than they do in the UK, and the, the great heroes of the campaign for wool are Paul Smith, Vivian Westwood, who we've seen in a, in, a, in, a, in a different context, and Christopher Bailey of Burberry, probably the most successful global fashion brand that the, in the last financial year made a profit of GB pounds 39 million. Um, not bad going in, uh, in what's called a crisis, in crisis times in Northern Europe. Um, we had 133 brands that supported the campaign for wool last year. 77 million people were reached by the PR campaign and we generate, I think, something like 60 million Australian dollars worth of value from the publicity generated in 2011. We did a very interesting little um, presentation to, the, to Prince William that cost very little, but it was through the generosity of Australian wool farmers who, I think, 220 of them contributed some wool it went into a, a sack, it went to Biella to be combed and to be spun. And it was woven in West Yorkshire by Taylor and Lodge, a company that was established in 1875. Um, it was a beautiful pinstripe worsted that Prince William is now wearing. Um, but I'll share a little secret with you. We had a slight panic because we were told by Clarence House we're not allowed to give wedding gifts and they run the risk of being returned because of ridiculous British tax laws about receiving gifts. So an, an inspiration came to us that we decided that we would make 100 suit lengths and auction the rest off for the Royal Flying Doctor Service, which is the charity dearest to Prince William's heart. So the gift was duly given and gratefully received, and the suit is being worn uh, as we speak. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the campaign for wool is alive and well. It is growing from strength to strength. And before I hand over to Stuart, this year, this week, next week, the week after, and indeed last week, the campaign for wool is being used and being promoted by uh, over 140 brands in UK, France, Germany, Japan, Holland, Norway, Korea, and now China. And next year, we'll be working in Italy and in India. We have an invaluable sign-off of our fabulous product by I would say the world's leading the world's leading environmentalist. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we're we're on Wool Pole. Uh, I want to take you through this quickly. I want to dwell a little bit on some figures that I've got at the at the back end of this segment, and then we're going into on farm and off farm research. So, uh, Wool Pole, we as you know, we're in a Wool Pole year, and uh, it's very important that everyone votes. So, when you uh, leave here, should you see neighbours, friends at the pub? Uh, wherever you come across wool growers, please encourage them to get out and vote. It's very important that we have as many people vote as, as possible. And that's what these events for. We, we, we want to get you uh, out there. We're filming this so that we can encourage people to vote. But if you use your own network, that'd be, that'd be wonderful and help us along. Uh, the strategic period you're voting on for the next, um, uh, for this wool poll is 13, 14, 14, 15 and 15, 16. That's the next strategic period of the company. Uh, kicking off 1st of July next year. So once uh, Wool Poll is finished, then we will write into the statutory funding agreement. We will go back to the government and renegotiate our contract with them, the, our agreement with the government, the statutory funding agreement. And that will happen early next year. And, and, and into that will be written some milestones and some reports that they want. Uh, we're also looking at changing the Wool Privatisation, Privatisation Act in the, next, uh, in the first six months of next year. Uh, on from that, we'll write a strategic plan that for that period, for this uh, strategic period, and we'll write an operating plan. And that all has to go to government before the end of June next, uh, next year. Um, with every wool poll, the board must make a recommendation. And the recommendation they make uh, for this wool poll is 2%. That was the same recommendation in 09. That's the same percentage you're paying today. Uh, it was the same in 06, 03 and 2000. 2% was the recommendation. What, what, what has been changed, and we talked about this in the, in, the, in the second slide after Barry Humphreys, is the ratio. We plan to, to change the ratio percentages slightly and change it to slightly in favour of marketing. 60% uh, 
uh, marketing and 40% into R&D. Now what I will say uh, about that, even though the ratio percentages change, the dollar expenditure in R&D will actually increase. And I'll show you how we're going to do that a little bit later on. So just remember that even though we're changing the percentages and reducing the percentage in R&D, the dollars expended in R&D will go up. And I'll show you the exact figures uh, in a little while. It opened on the 21st of September. So we're about halfway, a couple of days over halfway. Is that right, Peter? A couple of days over halfway, three weeks to go, a little under th three weeks to go. Uh, and it closes on the 2nd of November. On, that's the first Friday in November it closes. The first Tuesday in November, there's a little midweek race in Melbourne that you might know about. Uh, so the first Friday in November is, is, is when it closes uh, uh, and, uh, and the counting will, will start. Woolpole.com is, is up, it's, uh, it's available and the actual voting on woolpole.com.au on, on is really easy. We went through it the other day, I had the, my first look at it and it's very, very simple. You punch in your shareholder number, you punch in your postcode, and you can go straight to it, hit the button, and it's done. So if, you, if you're up to it, you're confident about the, the internet, then, then try woolpole.com. I wanted to talk just quickly about where our money comes from. And in the first strategic period of next, of the next, uh, first strategic year of the next strategic period, 13, 14, this is where the money will come from. So there's a lot of chatter in the uh, media about uh, you know, it's just levy and government funds. And certainly the government funds are very important, as is the levy. But we have other revenue sources. So when you vote at a wool poll, you vote for our existence and you vote for the revenue streams that flow in. There's about $6.7 million we get in licensing, fee from, licensing fees from the wool mark. The wool mark is a very, very vibrant business. And now that we've started putting money back into advertising and promotion and marketing, we're starting to get more licensees. For the first time in 20 years, that figure is going up again. We're getting more revenue in from more mark licensees. Very important. We have some investments. Naturally, with $100 million in the bank, you're going to get some interest. So there's some investment there. But there's a few other things as well. There's some, some throughput royalties. There's a few leases that we've got. Uh, so there's revenue from that. And then in the first strategic year, we're going to draw down on reserves to 15 million. So that's what, that's what the pie looks like in the first year. I just wanted to make, be crystal clear on that, where the money's coming from in the first year. That's, where it's, that's, that's the exact break, breakdown of, of where it's going to come from. And here's the exact figures. Now we're just going to spend a bit of time on this. And what I will say is the board has been looking at this slide, this model, for near on 12 months. Every board meeting, they've been looking at it, leading up to Woolpole. Uh, they haven't looked at it in the last month, but, but before that it was about a year. <coughs> and they tried, they modelled all sorts of things, and they wanted to monitor the, the Eastern Market Indicator as well. So we talk about, we talk about 12, 13 fiscal year. This is this year. And we, and we talk about our starting reserves at 103.4. That is the intangible equity I talked about. That is the formula, minimum reserves, untouchable reserves. That leaves you a net reserves available, 55 million. Then we're going to draw down on reserves this current year, 6 million. That will leave closing equity at the end of the year, 97.4. Then that goes up there. Then you go like that. And then it goes all the way down. Now, you'll see here at the top, we're working on a 50-50 ratio there and a 60-40 ratio for the next three years of the strategic plan. So that's above the line. Then you go into expenditure and you can see down here, it's quite low, but this year we'll, we'll spend $34.6 million on research and 34.6 on marketing, 50-50. That's what we'll do this year. You can't help getting a red figure when you draw down on reserves. If we, if we, if we dip into reserves and take some money out of reserves, we'll get a red figure. Now in a normal business, a red figure looks bad. In our business, you'd simp it's simply a reflection of us drawing down on reserves. So that's that year. <coughs> then we move into the next strategic period. This is what you're voting on, this period here. Starting equity, 97.4. Tangible equity stays. 37 million in untouchable reserves. 55 in uh, reserves available. We're going to draw down to the tune of 15 million the first year. That will leave our closing equity at 82. That goes to there and so on. 
One, I'll tell you what the, what the board were really keen to do. They were keen to leave some money in the bank at the end of the strategic period. They focused on this figure here, big time. Whatever they modelled, they kept going back to this figure. They didn't want to leave nothing in the bank. That's very, very sound, fiscally very, very prudent. 61.4 after the end of 15-16. The other thing they were very conscious of is not reducing the amount of money they spent on R&D. Even though they were moving the percentage, in the first year we'll spend more than we did this year. R&D expenditure goes up. It's slightly off there or on par with the uh, 12-13 year, but 36, 35 and 34. <coughs> the big bolstering comes in marketing naturally. We go from 34.6 to 54, 52, 51. That's where the big shot is. And the big shot's there because of one thing and one thing alone. We have a market on our doorstep, China, that's emerging with wonderful affluence and we have one opportunity to attract them to all. We think that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to put some money behind some marketing efforts there and those emerging people that are going to buy their first wool suit or their first wool sweater, buy it and enjoy the experience of wool. And we want to bolster the programs in that area. The other thing we're going to do is we stop spending money in the US. When the global financial crisis hit in the US, we shut it down. I was not going to spend money in a market that wasn't going to yield. We shut the office down, essentially closed it down. We also did the same with Japan when the tsunami hit. We knew that they would go into a period of mourning for a year or a couple of years. We knew that, so we, 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 we stopped spending there. We're not going to spend in a market that's not going to yield. But guess what? They're coming back. And in Europe, in the next couple of years, we'll be modest. We'll be very cautious about what we do there and where we do it. Only a few days ago, we closed, we shut off expenditure in Spain. The question was asked, should we be doing it? We said, absolutely not, get out of there, run. We pulled your money out of Spain. Now it's harsh, it's harsh and I'm sure it's not helping them, but in these times we have to be selfish with your money and we will be selfish. But, but they'll come back, Spain's not going away, Italy's not going away, Greece is not going away. They will return, make no mistake, and then we'll reinvest, but we'll invest when it's appropriate. The big opportunity is China. We think, we think it's gonna look like China, 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 and then China in the next few years. China is now taking 75% of the Australian wool clip. It's consuming half of that 75%. They are going from a mass, uh, they are going from a wonderful converter of greasy wool to garments to a wonderful converter of greasy wool to garments and consuming those garments. We don't think it's the start. If there was just 22 million of them, you'd say, right, oh, the affluence, they're gonna emerge and it's gonna cap out there. It's all gonna be done by 2016. There's 1.2 billion of them. We don't think it's the end, near the end. We don't think it's the middle. We think it's the very beginning of the beginning. And that's why we're bullish about this market. Because there, guess what? There's no more wool. There's no more wool. There's no one's growing any more wool. So the fundamentals haven't changed. The dollar's stable now. Into a macro headwind in 2009 and 10, with the dollar going against it and the economy in the States and, and Europe going against it, wool went up. Now how can that happen? How can that be possible? And it's possible because China is emerging with affluence. Mum used to say to me, uh, if only we could get every person in China to buy a pair of wool socks. We'll fix the problems of the wool industry. Now back when she was saying that, which is about 15 years ago, I didn't think that was that helpful. I didn't, it wasn't that helpful to me, you know. But she's not far from being right. I think we, we think they are emerging and going and buying their first wool suit and their first wool sweater. And we've got to capitalise on that. We've got to harness that and we've got to put programs behind those marketing uh, and those rands and those retailers that are going to that market and selling goods. And that's what the money's going against. And that's what we want to do with that extra budget. That's why we're increasing. So I wanted to dwell on that, on that slide. We wanted, to be, we wanted to be absolutely transparent. I'll tell, you what it, I'll tell you what was also suggested and I'll tell you who it was suggested by. The Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries said, leave the, leave the ratio at 50-50. Leave it there. And just use your, the extra money you want for marketing, take it out of reserves and put it into marketing, which is kind of what we're doing. But they said, just don't, just leave the 50-50. The board rejected that outright. They sent a letter back to the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. Is this not right, Roger? Mm. 
and said, no, they understand, wool growers understand the 50-50 ratio and you deserve to understand where the money's going. They understand that if you want to move the ratios, tell them what you're doing. And that's what we're doing. So I, I, I went to the board and I said, I'm going to show wool growers these figures. I'm going to be absolutely transparent about what we're doing. I wanted to lay it all out and get the questions on that. So I just thought I'd go through that slide and spend a bit of time on it. We're on the home straight. Uh, and I think I've got all the product I need. Look, these are, these are, these are our programs. These are the pillars of the on-farm research portfolio. They were the pillars in the last strategic plan, they're the pillars in the current strategic plan, and they're the pillars in the next strategic plan. And, 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 and despite what you read in the press, genetics and genomics features in the strategic plan now and in the next strategic plan. It's there, it stays, it's getting funding, and there's projects happening against that. That's what's going on. The board, you, you will have read, you must have read, uh, about the information nucleus flock 2 and what happened there. And the board rejected that proposal. That is their right to reject, that, uh, reject uh, projects. Not everything we put up to them gets through. And that's, that is the board expediting their fiduciary duty. They, that's what they do. That's what every board does. And they rejected that pro pro project. They didn't reject it because the science was flawed. The science was sound, very sound. The best, the best scientists in the world on this uh, tended that particular project. They didn't reject it for that. They rejected it because they couldn't see it being uh, uh, delivered to wool growers on a mass scale. A and people say, well, why can't it be delivered on a mass scale? And there was one figure, $130 a SNP test was prohibitive. They felt that that was prohibitive, and if it was $30, it may not be prohibitive. And maybe one day it will be at $30. But it's $130 now, and that's why they rejected it. So scientific region, you know, we've had all sorts of talk about why, why didn't they get a peer review? We had all the peer reviews. These people were the best scientists that could deliver that project. There's no doubt about that. But what the board couldn't see is a connection between the project and it being delivered to wool growers on a mass scale. And trust me when I say this, the, the board of AWI are there for wool growers on a mass scale, not for the few privileged in a different sector here or there. They talk about all wool growers as being equal. And it's very important you know that. So genetics and genomics is a big, important part of our strategic plan. It's going to be a part of our next strategic plan. Flies, um, and, and, and I just wanted to stay on flies for a little while. Fly strike prevention is, an, is another really important part of our on-farm research portfolio. And, and we have a very good project that's with the APVMA, the regulators at the moment, called Skin Traction. We've been working on it for some time. We are, we've done all the science we can do. We're up to here. So it will get no more money from us. We've had a commercial partner involved with this project for some time, Cobbett Technologies. Uh, it, is, it uses a piece of chemistry called sodium lauryl sulfate, which is found in uh, toothpaste and shampoos. It's a very benign piece of chemistry. And what happens is it, that chemistry is forced under the skin, pneumatically forced under the skin of the, of the animal, and it blocks the nutrients going to the skin what they call an S-scar or a skin scab forms. That skin scab falls away and you get a something that looks like a mules, a surgical mules. It's not quite as good as a surgical mules, but it looks very much like a surgical mules. There's a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, challenges they had to do. They had to get the pattern right around the breach area of, of, how, of how this was applied. They had to get the pressures right to get the, the chemistry under the skin, but not too far into, not into the muscle. So that was a challenge too. And they had to get the skin types of the lamb settled down a bit. So you're going to have to do older animals. So there's a few challenges there. They're going to be heavier. Uh, so that's a challenge. But, but, but the skin types of lambs vary dramatically as uh, when they're very young. Roger, Roger could give you <laughs> an hour lecture on this, I think. Uh, and as they get older, uh, they settle down a bit. So we had to... Uh, we have to do them a bit older. So we're training people, the applicator's done, the pattern's done, the chemistry's with the APVMA. Everything's pointing towards happiness here as, a, as an alternative. But we're not stopping there. But we have had a hiatus, you know. There's been not much coming through uh, in terms of new projects in this area. And in the last 12 months, there's been two interesting ones pop up, two interesting projects that are now under funding. Uh, one from the United States, which is quite interesting. 
uh, and we're just doing some initial trials and another piece of chemistry that was used by the CSIRO back in 1975 and there's been some advancements in uh, reacting or activating that chemistry which might offer us an opportunity. So that's quite a, uh, an interesting uh, progression. And then people say, well, what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere? How have you managed to settle that down? We haven't settled it down. We've just got on and done what we're meant to be doing, research. We're not suing. We're not suing Petter in courts. We're not going after them. We're not putting it on the radar screen of ra uh, retailers in the Northern Hemisphere. We're doing what you want us to do, R&D. And we'll continue to do that. Once a year, we do one thing in the Northern Hemisphere. We send a delegation, and Peter Slacksmith's just been on this delegation. She led this delegation. Once a year, at the start of the selling season, retail selling season, the retail selling season starts now. It's just been activated in the Northern Hemisphere. Northern Hemisphere, fall, winter selling season starts pretty much now. About a week or two weeks prior to that, Peter Slacksmith goes over to the Northern Hemisphere and she sees the National Retail Federation, she sees the British Retail Consortium, she goes to Brussels and she sees the, the EU there and she tells them what progress we're making in this research arena. That's what we do. And any retailers that happen to be interested can come along and see that briefing. But we don't go, we're not ringing them up and saying, can we come and talk to you about mulesing? And that's what used to happen. So that's what we do. We do the research and we communicate the progress on the research every year. And we stay on that pattern. We're not going, here. We're not going in March and then April and then June and September. We go at the beginning of September every year. That's when we go. So that's uh, flies. Worms uh, are, are, uh, are continue to be a, a challenge for, for wool growers and that's a big investment. Now the, the other two that I wanted to talk about, and, and, and I'll, tell you what the, I'll tell you what our board does. There's two things they bang the table on. Dogs and shearers, every meeting, they bang the bloody table and say, what are you doing? There is a great willingness, and you can talk to Roger about this, a great willingness to fix these two problems. And their appetite to spend more money in this, in this area is high. And they've put the challenge out to the executive of the company, come back with some ideas. And there's ideas coming back and those portfolios are both growing. When they first got in, we took $600,000 in operating costs out of the shearer and wool handler budget. I know it was $600,000 because they asked me to do it and I did it. So we went and we dropped it down to $858,000. I remember that was the first year budget. So we dropped it back to that. Now we're up to 1.3. And we're doing some awards and rewards programs with shearers and wool handlers. And in this, very this very facility is a great beneficiary of the shearer and wool handler training uh, and, and are doing a wonderful job. In fact, we've just poached one of their, one of their guys who's, who's come on staff uh, with, with us. Well, not poached, he... <laughs> he was a willing, willing, he willingly came and we're happy to have him. So that's uh, shearers and wool handlers. Dogs, we're funding the Invasive Animals CRC. That, that, that funding continues. This is just an extension uh, done in that area, but, but um, the board wasn't happy with that either. They said, no, 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 that's the social side of uh, 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 feral dogs. In fact, I had Gordy McMaster. You know Gordy McMaster? He, he, was at a, he was at Narandra the other night and he was sitting in and I, and I, I put up dogs. I said, we're going to kill them, we're going to kill them all. And he said, whoa, 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 hang on, you mean feral dogs, don't you? Because <laughs> he's a, a breeder of Kelpies. <laughs> and uh, he corrected me on that. So, so um, uh, yeah, we, we, we want to kill the feral dogs. <laughs> we we want to knock them out. Uh, and and, and it, so it sounds pretty rough, especially to, the, to, to, the, to, to, our, to our foreign guests tonight. But we want to kill dogs. We want to get rid of them, wipe them out. Uh, they're, they're no good and they're great. They're, they are prohibiting. Even when wool is equitable to be in, they are a barrier for wool growers to get back into this wool industry. There's a lot of other barriers too, but this is one. So we're keen to get them out of the way. And there's a lot of work we're doing with well-organised regional uh, groups that are willing to go out and kill dogs. We're helping them with baits. We're helping them with, with refrigerators and infrastructure and, and training to get, make sure that they've got money from the municipality or the council or the, or the state government and we're, gonna, and we're putting money in as well. And we're making effect. We're taking it, it's, it's having an effect. There's some parts of Australia that we're having a great effect on uh, with, uh, with control of wild dogs. So they're, they're the, um, the on-farm research. Post-farm research. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing in post-farm research. And these are uh, a pair of wool denim jeans. Now wool denim, you might remember, you might have uh, some wool denim. It was developed in 1988 by um, the uh, uh, Wool Corporation, actually. The Brad Mill were the commercial partner, and Just Jeans were another partner. And the fabric that they developed was had 12% wool in it. it. Still has 12, about 12% 12 wool in it. 
and the rest is cotton. And, um, uh, and the price of that fabric was uh, $14 a metre. So it was very expensive. Just to give you an idea, Levi's uh, buy their denim at $4 a metre. And they use about a metre in every pair of jeans. So the raw materials, if you add the zips and the, and the, and the studs and the, a bit of yarn, it might be $5 a material cost to, for a pair of jeans. But $7 was prohibitive. And I remember I, I lived and worked in the United States for four years and I, I was at we used to go over to Levi's and would show them this wool denim, the old wool denim, 12% wool, $14 a, a metre. And they, they liked the product, but they didn't like the price, naturally. They couldn't work out by putting 12% wool in there. You have to, you have to quadruple the price. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, justify that. So we went back to the drawing board with wool denim. And, and what we did is we um, uh, decided that we wanted to increase the wool content, first thing. And the second thing is we wanted to drop the price. And the only way we could drop the price is by using off-the-shelf wool and off-the-shelf cotton yarns. Now what they did with the 12% wool denim is intimately blended the yarn and put it into some roving and then spun it and then wove it into a fabric. So it was an intimate blend yarn which is expensive. And that's where the cost was in the product. So we've developed a new wool denim and there's three weights. There's 17% wool, 21% wool and 34% wool. These are a 34% wool denim. What we've then done is gone back to some of these partners, these big North American uh, jean partners, uh, and I won't mention the company that's going to commercialise it, and we've got their attention. And they will commercialise a wool denim jean at 21% in autumn, winter next year. One of the biggest jean companies in the world, you all know their name, in, in one of their very, very famous jeans, uh, and that will go into 120 countries next year. So that's a wool denim reinvention. The other thing I wanted to talk to you quickly about is Optum. You might remember Optum. Optum was a technology also developed in the late 80s, early 90s, and it was designed to stretch the wool fibre. And when you stretch a fibre, it reduced the micron. So a 19 micron became a 17 micron, 21 became uh, 19, and so on. And, 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 and they were the days where everyone coveted fine wool, but guess what? We've got a lot of fine wool now. We've done it through genetics. Uh, and these machines aren't as popular as they, uh, as they once were. In fact, they were never that popular. Uh, seven machines were made, five of them went to China, uh, four of them remain in uh, Inner Mongolia, and, and one is in uh, Shandong province. Uh, the company we're working with in Shandong province uh, has done some work for us recently, and it's not uh, about using Optum for its original purpose. So its original purpose was to fine up the micron, set the fibre in the stretched state, stretch it, set the fibre and put it into fine apparel or sweaters. Uh, and, 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 it, and it works well in that and it actually has a slippery handle, it comes out feeling a bit like a cashmere uh, and people like that but it wasn't really that popular. But, but what I did uh, remember seeing with CSIRO back in 01 or 02 is some work they'd done in, in temporarily setting the fibre. So they stretched the fibre, didn't set it but put it into some yarn and then put it into a very, very dense weave structure. Very dense weave structure. And then they used steam in the fabric state to shrink relax it and then it became denser. And what it creates is a waterproof wool fabric, totally waterproof, 100%. No membrane, no silicon, no, nothing, no, no Teflons, nothing on that except pure wool and it's waterproof. And that gets us into another area of where wool's never been and that's anoraks and, and, and uh, parkas and waterproof gear. A really important uh, innovation that's coming through. This is about, this portfolio is about getting wool into places that it hasn't been. That, 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 that wool denim is about below the waist casualisation. When we get out, out of our suits and we wear them every day, when we get out of our suits in the evening, we get into something casual, you are almost forced below the waist to put cotton on. There is no alternative, wool doesn't compete in that space. So we've got to address that because as China emerges with affluence, they're going to dress casual as well. They're going to buy their suits and they're going to buy their sweaters, but they'll also buy their jeans, guarantee you. And we need 10 projects in that area, 10 products in that area, not one. And this gets us into anoraks and um, waterproof gear. Have you found anyone to commercialise this yet? No, that fabric came out two weeks ago. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't, uh, we, we don't think there's going to be much problem with that. Teflon's coming under a huge amount of pressure. Uh, fluorocarbons have, have been found in all the bloodstreams of all of us, including Africans. So Teflon's, Gore-Tex, is a, is, a, is a product that's under pressure. 
all those shell garment fabrics are man-made petroleum-based uh, based products. And they're bloody expensive. And they're hugely expensive. The fabrics, the fabrics, just the fabric, forget about the garment, the fabrics in some of those technical textiles are up in the range of about $40 a, a metre. $40 a metre. Now you remember what I said about cotton denim? It's four. That wool denim product, seven. A wool suit fabric might be 15. These shell garments are 40. So it's not as if there's, it's not as if the price is going to worry them of wool. Price, wool, wool, wool could be $40 a kilo. It's still not going to worry them. Uh, so that's a, that's a waterproof fabric and, um, uh, and that's a, that's, that's a wash sample that's, that's, that we've been using. So that's that. We're on the last two products in the last, two, the last slide, so uh, uh, bear with me. Um, this, this is not, uh, this garment is um, actually, in terms of uh, the fabric, isn't that innovative? There's no topical treatments on this. Um, uh, it's, it's a 28 gauge piece of base layer knitwear. Uh, you might know of some brands like Icebreaker and Snow Gum that do this sort of stuff. So the fabric uh, is not innovative, but what is innovative is the structure of the garment, the design of the garment. And I'll sh tell you why. We've been working with Invest Tech Loyal, which is the boat that won the city to Hobart actually wins it last year, just last year. It goes off on Boxing Day and it gets down to Hobart just before New Year's Eve. And we've been working with a crew of Invest Tech to design a garment that's the perfect sailing garment. There's great innovation in colour and cut and texture and drape. It doesn't have to be a topical treatment. And this is a garment that we've been design designing with them. And, 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 and that alone is an innovation. They've asked us to extend the cuff on the top there, so it goes over their hands and protects their hands against sunburn. They wanted things in the back, like a little pocket in the back. They, they use muesli bars, and they, they want to poke muesli bars in the, in, the, in, the pack, in the back there. So we've cut all those in it. The idea of this is to tender wool as a technical textile and then de develop these garments in consultation with these partners. These all have windproof zips in them. Uh, and, and actually merchandise garments with our brand on them that are, spe are specifically designed for that particular market. So the fabric is an innovative, the cut of that garment and the, and the innovations that are in the zips and the placements of the pockets and the cuffs and the shoulders and the, and the sewing in the, in, the, uh, in the neck. Very interesting way of doing things. We want to do that with a whole raft of different industries. We want to make the perfect sailing garment. We want to make the perfect football garment. And this is a... I don't know how you feel about these, this mob. I suppose it's a bit too far. Oh, maybe it's not too far north. Uh, Collingwood Football Club will, uh, will wear wool in their garment jersey again next year. Now, there's a few grey hairs here. There's a few blokes that look like they may have played in uh, wool, wool, wool football jumpers once upon a time. And, of course, the reason that they uh, weren't continued was a thing called sublimation printing. What they, uh, what they used to do in my day is that used to be a badge that would be sewn on and, and, and that would be sewn on. Now they get a white garment and they just print it all on. And it's quite a, uh, it's quite a technical textile actually. One of these, um, there's a pocket in the neck there that they have GPS trackers in. All AFL players for the last few seasons have been wearing GPS trackers. In the back of their, at the back of their neck, it looks like a little matchbox in the back there, and this is a link spun, a link spun uh, wool uh, wool polyester blend. Again, it's not a garment that's going to consume a lot of wool, but it positions wool as a technical textile, which is very important. We don't want to just tender wool as a tailored textile; we want to tender it as a technical textile. So those some of that. Okay, that's. Uh, the presentation. We're through the presentation and I wanted to open it up now to uh, questions. We've had some questions as we, as we went through, but I'm, I'm perfectly, as are the others, perfectly uh, willing to take a, uh, some, some more questions if we've got them.